hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'm looking across a room of people, not a single one of whom ate too much on Thursday because you're all that self-disciplined and I admire that. But uh, it is a time of year when we're thankful. It's a time of year where we're thoughtful. We take stock. And I want to thank all of you, everyone here who's part of making this city great. I want to thank all the members of my administration who are here, all the public servants, all the leadership of the NYPD, this extraordinary team of leaders you see here that makes such a difference every day. I want to thank the union leadership who represents the men and women of the NYPD. I want to thank the elected officials who support the NYPD and its work. And I want to express my thankfulness. And I'm listening to the words of Rabbi Kass, and as always, he makes us for a moment pause and think of the bigger picture, and he invokes scripture so beautifully. The scripture is ultimately positive and hopeful and aspirational. It helps us think about who we can and should be, how far we can go. And it makes me thankful when I think about this city, how far we've come. And we've come so far because of our people. I'm first and foremost thankful for the people of this city, this extraordinary gathering of humanity like no place else on earth that somehow every day shows the rest of the world that we can find a kind of harmony, we can find a way to work together. It's not perfect, but it actually works. And it's why we're the greatest city in the world. I'm thankful to the men and women of the NYPD who keep us safe, who every year go farther, who show us that things are possible we didn't believe even just a few years ago. Thankful to everyone who has created today's NYPD. And so thankful that there is such an extraordinary reservoir of talent, such commitment, such belief that is in this department, in this building, making us stronger all the time. And I am truly thankful for Dermot Shea, for all he has done for this city and all he will do. And I want to talk about Commissioner Shea in just a moment, but I want to frame it in a way that I think really gets to the heart of who he is and what he brings to us. Because when you think about it, this is all about what direction we will take. This is all about whether we will be a hopeful place, a forward-looking place, a place that believes we can be even greater or whether we're tethered to our past in a way that's not productive and positive. That's the question before us. Are we able to move forward? I've watched for the last six years extraordinary things happen. I've watched some of the most profound challenges be taken on head-on by the NYPD. And one of the things I've tried to tell the people of this city who, who don't get to watch the inner workings, who don't get to see the minds of these extraordinary talents who lead this agency, and don't get to see the everyday work of our officers and understand just how extraordinary it is, one of the things I constantly try to explain is that this department does not rest on its laurels. It is a hotbed of innovation and creativity and because it is that, it is also a hotbed of hope and aspiration. Sometimes I look at the papers, or I look at TV and the news, and I see a, a story being told doesn't resemble the New York City I see. Sometimes I see a story of a New York City that is stuck in its past, that can't move forward. And that's not what I see every single day in the neighborhoods of our city. Because we will not go back. I want to be very clear. I've heard the voices of our people, and I've seen the work of not only the NYPD, but all our public servants. And it's quite clear, we will not go back. We will not go back to a time when crime pervaded our lives, 
people lived in fear. That is now a part of our past. And when you say that, and when I say it, it is not meant to be blind faith. In fact, it is faith based on the evidence of the extraordinary work of this department and of the partners that the men and women of the NYPD find every single day in every neighborhood of our city. More partners all the time because of the power of neighborhood policing. So when I say we will not go back, it is based on proof. It's based on the resolute nature of the people of the city. The fact that this department always aims higher. To the doubting Thomases, to the naysayers, if you doubt, then you don't truly respect the NYPD. If you think we will somehow slip back into our past, you do not understand what is happening here. We will never go back. Nor we will, go, will we go back to the division of the past. Just a few decades ago in this city, and I say this with no joy, but the truth is, so often neighborhood was pitted against neighborhood, people against people. Too often our police and our communities saw each other as foreign instead of kindred, instead of brothers and sisters. We have more work to do, but we will never go back to that division. We will never go back to that misunderstanding. We have turned a page in this city. And as neighborhood policing has taken hold, and I express my deep gratitude to everyone on this stage who have been architects and creators of this new way of policing, as it has taken hold, we see our officers more and more given the gratitude and respect they deserve. We see people in our neighborhoods who want to do good, who want to help make their neighborhoods better, feeling a sense of partnership and a bond with the NYPD. We are only just beginning down this road. So my answer to the doubting Thomases is, look at the history before you, look at the evidence, and you realize not only will we not go back, we have just begun on a road to a different and better place, to be that city that Rabbi Cass described. We can be that city on a hill that all of humanity looks to as an example of our better selves. And that brings me to our gathering today. It is an awesome responsibility to lead this city and one of the most important decisions a mayor makes is the choice of police commissioner. It is a choice that has to be made with a reverence for the meaning of that office and for the meaning of this department. An understanding that when you get that decision right, a lot of other things fall into place in this city for the good of all. I had a tremendous advantage of having watched Dermot Shea in action for six years. And if you watch him, if you've ever seen him at a Comstat meeting, if you've ever seen him in a strategy session, you see an extraordinary active mind. You see a man who believes we can go much farther, not just a little bit, we can go much farther. Someone who has such inherent faith in this department and the men and women who make it great but also has a belief in our people and a love for the people of this city. When he grills a colleague, it's not out of anger, it's out of hope that we can get even better. When he puts an idea out that no one's thought about before or been willing to say out loud, it's because he's not afraid to dream. It's a rarity that you get to watch someone for six years through thick and thin deal with every kind of scenario. But what I saw 
was a man who was always ready to innovate, always ready to hope. And I saw the inspirational impact that he had on others. Because when you're around someone who believes it's contagious, when you're around someone who sees the good, you start to see the good yourself. I've seen him in the halls of this building. I've seen him in our communities. He's the same person wherever he goes because he knows the streets of this city. He knows our people. He feels that deep connection. It's not just what he thinks about. It's what he feels in his heart. So I am profoundly inspired to think about what could happen in the next few years and beyond, what we could all build here. I know from talking to Dermot, as he's gone around this city, he's met with precinct councils and civic associations, community boards. He's been to houses of worship. People keep telling him that they believe. They believe in what the NYPD has achieved and what it is capable of going forward. They believe that we're on the dawn of something even greater. When I had the honor of introducing Dermot as the next police commissioner, he said something that cause people all over the city to pay special attention. And here's a man who epitomizes Comstat, all that that extraordinary strategic approach has achieved for this city. But he said something visionary. He said, what have we started to track the crimes that we prevented? What have we started to think about the ways we stopped the bad before it ever happened. What have we thought about building a society where so many of our young people never went on the wrong path, but felt the respect and the embrace of their city and were inspired to find the good in themselves? It's an extraordinary notion, but this is the time for extraordinary ideas. This is the time to aim higher. So I will tell you right now, as I prepare to administer this oath, we will make this city safer, and we will make this city fairer, and those two ideas must go together. This is our future, and we will deepen that sacred bond between our communities and their guardians. I'll say one last thing. We all come from somewhere originally, every one of us. In many cases, just a generation ago or a few generations ago, we all come from another place. Some came here willingly, some did not. But we all come from not too far back in our ancestry, a village. In every village, in every society, every culture, there were guardians. The guardians were chosen to protect the village. It was a position of honor and respect. The finest in the village assumed that responsibility, and they were beloved. We may not be a village anymore, but we need to find that in our hearts. It's part of who we are. It's part of our DNA. We need to find that understanding again. That those who are our guardians are of and by and for our communities. They deserve our love and our respect and our support. And equally, they will know that they are part of the people they serve. That 
is what we are creating, and that is why we will never go back. With that, it is a profound honor to entrust the safety of the people of this city, 8.6 million New Yorkers, to our next commissioner. And Dermot, to you, to Serena, to your mom, Ellen, to your kids, Jacqueline, Lauren, Richie, to your entire wonderful family, family of extraordinary people who epitomize the American dream, the immigrant dream, who epitomize a commitment to public servant. I say to the entire Shea family, thank you for bringing Dermot up the right way. You all, you all deserve a lot of credit. Let's give them a round of applause. And Serena, as I saw in the very first days, you two are amazing partners, and you do such wonderful things together for this city. Let's thank Serena as well for all she does. So to Dermot and to the Shea family, on behalf of all 8.6 million New Yorkers, a profound congratulations on this extraordinary day. And now, Dermot, if you will step forward, we will administer the oath. <laughs> I do hereby pledge and declare. I do hereby pledge and declare to uphold the Constitution of the United States. To uphold the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And to faithfully discharge my duties. And to faithfully discharge my duties as police commissioner of the city of New York. As police commissioner of the city of New York. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done, Thank you. Congratulations. Love you. Love you too. Well done. We'll be needing this. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor and privilege to introduce the 44th Police Commissioner of the City of New York, the Honorable Dermot Shea. I just have to say this, Mr. Mayor, I'm not sh quite sure the people in the front row viewed CompStat with such uh, <laughs> glad tidings, but it makes us better. Good morning, everyone. I want to start out by saying thank you. I will certainly forget to mention some people simply because there are so many who should be acknowledged. But thank you to all my friends, family, co-workers, union officials, co-workers past and present, uniformed and civilian, and all the elected officials, many of whom I see here, and other dignitaries. Thank you to all those who traveled from far and wide in not the perfect weather today, including some of our line of duty families. And regarding our line of duty families, whether here or not, 
really is irrelevant. We will never forget the sacrifices made by their courageous loved ones, our friends and colleagues. And we vow always to remember that the emotional toll and sacrifice has not ended for them. The mothers, fathers, husbands and wives, sons and daughters of our heroes. Thank you. There are three additional people in particular that I respect and to whom I owe a great deal. Bill Bratton, Jim O'Neill, and my friend to my left, Ben Tucker. I've learned so much from each of these men, three leaders who have long understood that law enforcement is so much more than a job. It's a vocation, a vocation that calls many of society's best people to service, and each has in its own way left his mark on our profession. And thank you, Mayor de Blasio, for putting your confidence in me to lead this great organization. I, <laughs> Hi, Aiden. <laughs> I could not possibly be more proud to serve as the 44th police commissioner of the greatest police department in the world. It is truly humbling. And I'm looking forward to working with everyone who lives, works, and visits here to make New York City even safer. The man I am today, I am because of two people. My mother and father, two immigrants who came from Ireland in the 1950s. Sorry, Mom, I mentioned the year. <laughs> Met here in New York, settled in Queens, and raised five children, all of whom are here. They came here like so many others with a dream for a better life. And they instilled in me and all their children values that to this day make us who we are. Values such as sacrifice, love, faith, decency, treating all people as you would your own family. Mom, thank you and I love you. I'll pay for that later. <laughs> to my best friend and loving wife of nearly 28 years, Serena. <laughs> I couldn't begin to put into words what you mean to me. It wouldn't be possible, but thank you. To our children, Jackie, Lauren, Richie, special shout out to Aiden there. I guarantee this is the last time that you will ever have to come to another promotion ceremony at One Police Plaza. <laughs> On a serious note, my family, like most law enforcement families, took in stride the frequent late nights, the many missed holidays and other special occasions, and what I know is an extremely stressful reality for all families of police officers, the worrying, the holding of breath as we leave our house each day to go about the critical business of keeping others safe. It is without a doubt their encouragement and backing that made this day in this auditorium possible. A walk down memory lane. My first 20 years as a cop was spent on the streets. 4-6, uh, Terry? 4-6 after graduating from the police academy in 1991. I always found great satisfaction in walking out of the station house just to head to post after receiving my assignment at roll call. 184th Street to 187th Street, Ryer Avenue. That was the first post I ever took, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And my partner is here somewhere, Mike. You never knew, quite knew what to expect each tour. But I'll tell you, I loved every bit of it, especially the simple things. Just walking out, walking on post, reading people, talking to people. Back then, there was such open-air drug markets that oftentimes people were scared to talk to the police because of retribution by drug dealers. Back then, tips were wish whispered in hushed tones as you would enter a building and somebody would brush past you telling you where the drug dealers were in the building, but scared to say it openly. There would be many assignments over the years, but I'll tell you something. There was always one common denominator wherever I worked in all of them. 
I genuinely thought that I would never work with better people in every single assignment that I had. Along the way, I was privileged to lead two commands in the Bronx, Larry Nacune and current Bronx commander, the 50th Precinct in Riverdale and the 44th Precinct in Highbridge. <laughs> now, if you aren't familiar with the Bronx, 4-4 is home to the New York Yankees, which was always a running joke because I was a diehard Met fan. So more than once, probably from some jokesters in this place here today, I would come to work and there would be Yankee paraphernalia strewn all over my desk, which I would promptly throw in the garbage. But the irony wasn't lost on me when years later, I realized I was to be the 44th police commissioner in the city of New York. So I guess things have now come full circle. Thinking back on those early 90s, something else I'll tell you. I, re I recall seeing poverty on the streets of the Bronx as I've never seen it before. What struck me then, and I've never forgotten it, is how much people depend on the police for their daily lives. New York was a very different, much more violent place back then. The year I joined the NYPD, it was between 2,100 and 2,200 homicides just that year. Think of that. Last year, 295, and it was because of the work of the men and women of this great department. Burned out buildings, garbage strewn streets, vacant lots, have now been replaced by parks and condominiums. And while the city has been absolutely transformed, and policing too has changed in many respects, there are some constants that are as true today as they were 29 years ago. Policing is about more than public safety. It's about service. It's about, as the mayor said, providing hope to those sometimes that have no hope. It's a bit about protecting those who cannot protect themselves. It's about changing lives. So this is my message to police officers. Never forget for one second, not one second, the impact that you have on others' lives. It's not always easy to me measure, but I guarantee to you it is happening. From a police officer comforting a crime victim in their darkest hour, to standing watch as people walk home, preventing them from ever becoming victims and the trauma that comes with it, to working with kids and being a role model. You do all this and so much more, and sometimes in an eight-hour shift. It's often said that law enforcement, we interact with people on their worst days, and that is true if you think about it. When do people call 911? When they are most vulnerable, and that's true which is why it's so important that you never take for granted your ability to give that person something to believe in. Again, never ever underestimate your impact. You literally change people's lives. So for that, <laughs> as we said in we could in 2014. We've shown that we can drive crime down significantly with a far less intrusive enforcement profile. In fact, we've done what many believed was impossible. We've pushed crime down while also reducing criminal summonses, stops, arrests, and incarceration. And throughout our police department, we are building trust and strengthening relationships in every New York City community, and more to do. Neighborhood policing and precision policing are seamlessly blended together and serve, I believe, as a model of American policing and proof that, yes, you can have it all. No one is better than NYPD police officers at fighting crime, and no one is better than NYPD detectives at solving cases. So to the members of the Detective Bureau, and I'll tell you a little side note, for a brief moment the other night I held, as I look at Jimmy Luongo, I held the Chief of Detective Shield and the police commissioner shield and got a picture of it in one hand and then they ripped the chief of detective shield from me. <laughs> but it'll make a great picture, Jimmy. I'll get you a copy of it. To the members of the detective bureau for a moment, you were the epitome of professionalism. You were the heart and soul behind precision policing and a major reason that we can lay claim to the title safest big city in America. So hats off to the members of the detective bureau. This is great. I can now command clapping whenever I feel like it. 
So to the detectives, you have no rivals, and I really appreciate the work the last 18 months. But we're not done, far from it. Now is not the time to look back as an agency at all we've accomplished. Now is the time for us to look ahead to what we can accomplish, what we will accomplish. We are going to build upon the framework of neighborhood policing, both to bolster existing relationships and to create new ones from one end of New York City to the other. We must not only call on our colleagues in law enforcement, though, to achieve this. We must also create new partnerships with residents, clergy, community-based groups, private sector entities. We must also be resilient and remember that declines in crime are never to be taken for granted. Whether it's murder, shootings, robberies, sexual offenses, stories that we've seen lately of increases in assaults on the transit system, we must remain vigilant. We must remember that we are the advocates for the victims, for the survivors. And we are the ones who must ensure that they are never left behind. We must also be responsive to residents at every opportunity, remembering that every single encounter, from a 311 call to a, about a blocked driveway, to a trip to the local precinct to report a crime, is an opportunity to strengthen neighborhood policing and how we deal with the public. Each encounter is an opportunity, I believe, to make a first impression. There are significant challenges on the horizon, however. We've seen some signs of them. People that live in our communities, too, have already talked about them. Looming changes that, again, will test you and test your ability to keep New Yorkers safe. But I believe we are a very strong organization. I have confidence in you. Because time after time, you have proven your dedication to the people of this great city. And I know we will adapt and work with all of our partners to seek change as necessary to keep everyone safe, including our police officers. Members of every community and every neighborhood should feel they understood by their police and know they are being treated fairly. And that's how people come to view their police through a lens of trust. We do have a common adversary after all, those who commit crime and violence. Let me be clear for a second. I don't want to see one more child killed. I don't want to see one more young person shot. I don't want to see one more completely avoidable funeral. At the same time, I don't want to see one more kid wander onto the road of getting arrested if we can do something better to keep him or her out of that situation. And I know that these are desires shared by all 8.6 million New Yorkers and the millions more who come here on a daily basis. If we can prevent those things, if we can live together in a city that provides safety for all, that keeps young people from ever being introduced to the criminal justice system, the feeding ground of crime will be uprooted. We must do that now. And I'm asking everyone here to join me in doing it. But I want to remind everyone something, that closer connectivity will never mean that the NYPD is soft on crime. There's the adage, don't mistake our kindness for weakness. So let me be very unequivocal. There is and must always be zero tolerance for any sort of violence against our police officers. weeks ago, a report came across my desk, had to do with the Hate Crimes Task Force, graffiti scrawled on a police car in Brooklyn. The graffiti consisted of swastikas alongside a derogatory mention of the NYPD. That incident to me should serve as a reminder to everyone sitting here and watching. Hate is hate, and it should be de denounced wherever and whenever it appears, period. An attack on a single officer is an attack on society as a whole. It should and must be denounced by all New Yorkers, especially those in leadership positions. It's as simple as this. Every person we see deserves respect. Every cop must be respected, too, if they are to do their very dangerous job correctly. This is always a two-way street. 
approaching 2020. Don't worry, Rabbi Cass, I'll finish up quickly. <laughs> With every New Yorker entitled to safety, I believe we stand on the threshold of taking our nation's safest big city and making it a city in which every neighborhood is as important as every other, where every child can grow up free of the threat of crime. It is now our obligation to achieve, through the partnerships I've discussed, through a new level of public support and public action, our common mission of public safety. That is how we will strengthen our bonds where they already exist and bridge the divide where they don't. In the coming days, you will see our leadership team and our vision for the next couple years come to focus. I can tell you that the NYPD has made vast improvements in recent years to better reflect the city we serve, and we will keep making dramatic progress by investing in those working hard to climb the ranks currently. We're also going to invest heavily in our city's young people by deepening opportunities for kids, especially teenagers. Soon we'll be making an announcement about a new directive regarding our overall youth strategies throughout the department. These efforts will focus specifically on guiding kids along the path to keep them out of the criminal justice system, ensuring they would ever stumble down the wrong path. It's time to think about how we can equip and enable our police to help young people steer free of a first act of criminal behavior. But again, we want, indeed, we require the help of partners, neighborhood groups, and everyone else we serve. As a police department, we're not afraid to take the lead on this, but it's imperative that our efforts are supported citywide. This all ties into neighborhood policing, of course, and it translates into something else, effective crime fighting. We're at a point where this can all become reality. A totally safe city, just 25 years ago, unimaginable. How we get there is the next level of neighborhood policing. So in closing, as your police commissioner, everything I've described is at the heart of what we do. To be trusted with protecting people, I believe, is a solemn and sacred responsibility. And at the same time, it's an absolute privilege. So we vow to serve everyone, to always be there for them, and we promise to do, especially for those who need our help the most, what nobody else can do. And importantly, we will prove that when the public and police work together, we can make positive, lasting change. That change begins when people are safe, and it's sustained when people feel safe. I'm confident that New York will continue to be a city that leads this country, a city that embraces its similarities and its differences, a city that is and for many years to come will be a shining example in the United States of America of exactly how policing should look. Thank you very much.